Welcome to uh, the northeast of England, uh, to Newcastle upon Tyne, uh, for those who are, are not with us. Uh, to give you an idea of things, it's still sunny outside, but the wind hasn't stopped blowing in, uh, in about maybe 30 or 40 days. It is incredibly blustery, uh, and we're delighted to have you here. Um, uh, my name is Connell Mallory. I'm, the, uh, I'm a senior lecturer in law in the, uh, the, the law school at Newcastle. Um, I, I'm also the convener of our forum for human rights and social justice. Um, our, our forum is a broad based multidisciplinary um, uh, grouping of research academics and some practitioners. Um, uh, and we do various different things. We, we work with scholars, with policymakers, with uh, non governmental organizations, and with civic society. But we we, we uh, also try to look at issues which are local, national, and international in nature. And our, our, our central risen detra really is education uh, and using our uh, education and expertise to, um, to, to, to try. And assist in issues around human rights and social justice. In, in that guise, um, I was uh, approached by my, my colleague, Bronwyn Jones, Dr. Bronwyn Jones, who, who's uh, with us this evening, uh, about the uh, evolving issue in, uh, in circumstances in, in Bosnia, although uh, to say that they are the, the tensions or the problems are, are, are recent is, per, is perhaps to, to misconstrue the, uh, the events. Um, when Brahman contacted me about the, uh, the contemporary situation in, in Bosnia, um, uh, there were no more than a handful of, of uh, tweets um, circulating in, uh, uh, on, uh, on, on recent issues. You, you really had to, had, to, had to search to try and find um, uh, more uh, discussion on the, uh, the contemporary challenges. Since then, the, the, the uh, media um, reporting in uh, the English-speaking world has increased dramatically on it. Uh, one of our guests tonight, um, uh, uh, um, uh, Vanya, has uh, uh, done quite an extensive interview with, with uh, RTE on, on the matter, and uh, um, uh, only last week, uh, Jeremy Bowen of the BBC published a, a story, and so it's becoming increasingly um, uh, commonplace to know uh, what the situation is. For the purposes of tonight, we're um, uh, going to be educated on it uh, by uh, by uh, three experts, and I, I'm going to hand over to uh, to one who's uh, from uh, uh, from Newcastle, close to home, uh, and uh, he's going to chair our panel this evening, and that's uh, that's Smile Besso. So uh, I'll hand over to you, Smile. Please take us uh, take us forward. Thank you, Connell. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for. <clears throat> Thank you to Newcastle Forum for Human Rights and Social Justice for hosting us this afternoon, and especially to Connell and Bronwyn. Um, we hope that this event will help to raise awareness about the current worrying situation in Bosnia. We'll examine why it's relevant uh, for us here in the UK and how we can react and engage uh, more with what is happening in Bosnia, because I can safely say that most people living in Bosnia, all of its citizens, want to live in a peaceful country. Um, before I introduce our two speakers, I just want to spend a few minutes um, very quickly giving a bit of the context. Now, for some of you, I know it's going to be incredibly um, basic, so I apologize in advance, but I think it might be useful just in terms of setting up um, the talks by Vanya and Azra. Um, to, to kind of start discussing what happened in Bosnia in the 90s and what is happening now, because what we're seeing in Bosnia now is nothing new. We really need to understand that basic uh, context. And Bosnia is often presented as being something very complicated. Um, and I think that's how it was portrayed in the 90s as well, complex, unknown, everyone killing everyone, a land of ancient hatreds where people have been killing each other for centuries. This, of course, isn't true. Um, it didn't help Bosnia then, um, and it's not helping Bosnia now. Um, and we can see the evidence of that through the various international proposals for Bosnia at the moment, which, which would only further reward genocide and fascism and segregation. But what do these proposals actually mean for people that are living there now? How does it affect people that, have, that are still suffering from the trauma they experienced in the 90s? And I think there's a bit of detachment there um, that, that I think needs to be kind of looked at in more depth. The war in the 1990s is still often labeled as a civil war, um, even though there have been several international rulings stating otherwise. 
What happened in Bosnia is often also simplified to July of 1995 and the Srebrenica genocide, where more than 8,000 um, Bosniak, predominantly boys and men, were slaughtered in just a couple of days. And I speak in events across the country, and I'm surprised by how many times I've turned up to an event where people, well-meaning people, have organized an event and they thought that was the extent of what happened in Bosnia. Um, but in reality, what happened in Srebrenica in July of 1995 was just the culmination of atrocities that happened across Bosnia starting as early as 1992. In total, more than 100,000 people were killed, more than 60,000 young girls and women were raped, more than 2 million people were displaced or became refugees. I think there's more than a million Bosnians living abroad, like, like me and my family. Um, and the war between 1992 and 1995 occurred, and again, I'm kind of brushing over the detail here, so I apologize, but hopefully it'll be enough to kind of leave you guys um, with a bit of context. But it happened in, in, in the wider context of the political unraveling of the former Yugoslav Federation, of which Bosnia was one of the six constituent republics. Bosnia was also by far the most ethnically diverse of those republics, um, with the three main ethnic groups, the Bosniak, the Serbs, and the Croats, um, especially where my family's from in southern Bosnia. Um, there was a lot of intermarriages in my family, which is predominantly Muslim. We've had Catholics or Croats, we've had Serbs, obviously atheists, and there was a lot of families that were as uh, diverse as mine. Um, Slovenia and Croatia uh, were the first to break away, followed by Bosnia in early 1992 after an independence referendum, which is overwhelmingly backed by the citizens of Bosnia. I think something like 64% of the population came out, and I think of that 64%, and maybe Azra can correct me here, 99% voted for an independent Bosnia. Uh, Bosnian Serb nationalists stir, uh, spurred on by neighboring Serbia or Yugoslavia, as it was still then, and the ideology of a greater Serbia attempted to break away from Bosnia by establishing a Serbian entity, Republika, uh, Republika Srpska, which is often uh, interestingly translated into English as a uh, Serbian Republic. But actually, as far as I know, there isn't a official translation of this, but you'll see it in a lot of the reports that you come across. Um, and the ultimate aim was to become part of greater Serbia. So killing ethnic concentration camps started almost immediately. By 1993, uh, roughly a year into the war, a separate war broke out when the Bosnian Croats again spurred on by neighboring Croatia um, and similar nationalist ideologies established the Croatian community of Herzeg Bosna. Again, this is a largely unknown part of the war. Um, the International Crime Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia labeled the entire leadership, so both military and political, a joint criminal enterprise with the objective of ethnic cleansing uh, the non croat population for the ultimate purpose of creating a Croat entity in Bosnia. And again, similar to the Serbian entity in order to eventually become part of the Republic of Croatia. As part of the same uh, ruling, Croatian president Franjo Tudjman was actually found to have participated and contributed to this joint criminal enterprise. Surrounded in the middle, these predominantly, but again, not exclu exclusively uh, Muslim. Again, the Bosnian government during the war was often um, presented as the Muslim side, um, but there were a lot of Croats and Serbs uh, and other groups that remained on the Bosnian uh, government side and um, fought for a largely, um, to largely sort of uphold the integrity and plur pluralistic nature um, or multi-ethnic nature of uh, Bosnia. So the war against Bosnia ended with the signing of the Dayton Peace Agreement in December of 1995. Um, however, it also consolidated the sort of newly created ethno-national homogenous landscapes, which were far from the sort of reality of pre-war Bosnia. Um, and the violence against Bosnia 
um, never really stopped or never went away. It's actually enacted through other means. And that's what my research here at the university looks at, how the built environment, I, I'm an architect by training, how the built environment is actually used to enact violence through various spatial practices against Bosnia and the people of Bosnia. Uh, the peace agreement divided the country into two entities, so the Republika Srpska and the Federation of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, as well as a district. Um, and this really represented the reality on the ground at the time of the signing of the agreement, which was, as I said, far from the reality of pre-war Bosnia. It also bestowed Bosnia on Bosnia an extremely complex system of governance, which I'm sure our speakers will uh, elaborate on further detail. And now Bosnia is a country where war criminals walk and live freely in the communities that they once terrorized. War criminals and genocide are openly denied and celebrated. The system has allowed for the same ideologies not to only exist, but to also flourish. And now the same hateful ideology is inspiring fascists across the world from uh, Anders Breivik, uh, the white supremacist that killed 77 people in Norway, I think it was in 2010 or 2011, um, as well as um, the Christchurch terrorist um, who killed 52 people in a mosque in uh, New Zealand. They were both influenced by uh, Serbian ultranationalism. Tarrant, who was actually um, the man responsible for the shooting in New Zealand, on his way to the mosque, he was actually listening to a Serbian ultranationalist or fascist song. He actually had the names of Serbian knights on his gun. I think Brevik in his thousand page manifesto also mentions Karadzic and Mladic and other um, Serbian war criminals from the 90s. Um, in this country, for an example, um, on something that I'm working on recently, um, there are issues around human trafficking. Uh, and in Europe as well. And recent reports have found that it's not only groups from the Balkans that are kind of leading this new wave. Um, it's actually the same groups or same individuals that were around in the 90s, which is incredibly, incredibly scary. Um, there was also a recent report that there are more than 300 uh, foreign fighters in Ukraine at the moment, either fighting for the um, Ukrainians or the Russians. Um, and for me, this isn't just a Bosnian problem. I think it's proven that it's actually a regional problem. It's a European uh, problem and it's being exported across Europe and across the world. So the last um, now nearly 30 years, um, the system, I think also the international community has allowed for these ideologies to manipulate the past. And the aim um, isn't really to prove that the genocide didn't happen because the genocide is incredibly well documented. It's one of the best uh, document, document the genocides. Um, the idea is to cast doubt, you know, everyone killing everyone, a civil war, it's complicated and so on. These are all the result of the same manipulations. Um, so the UK is uh, probably, I would say, Bosnia's biggest friend at the moment. And I think um, that is down to the incredible work by our ambassador, who we will hear from in a few minutes. Um, the UK government is doing by far the most in Europe, far more than any other, I would say, again, maybe Vanya can correct me here, far more than any um, of its uh, European neighbours. And it's definitely leading the way in terms of positive engagement in Bosnia. But the media coverage, as Connell said at the start, is virtually non-existent. Um, the little media coverage that we've had. Um, there was a good report by Jeremy Bowen. There was one or two others. Um, without being too harsh, I would say it's often been uh, superficial or shallow. Uh, not all, of course. Um, often written by journalists or researchers or analysts that haven't actually even visited Bosnia, or maybe if they go to Bosnia, they'll just visit Sarajevo, but not actually visiting the communities across the country that, that are kind of affected by this every single day. Um, considering this happened in our lifetime and so close to the UK, it's still so unknown for us here um, in the UK. And there are so many lessons to be learned from what happened in Bosnia in the 90s. And for me, one of the best ways to engage with that history is to listen to the stories of those that witnessed um, these atrocities firsthand. And that's basically um, what the Bosnian Genocide Educational Trust does. And the experience of Bosnia shows 
that you know we must challenge all forms of prejudice and hatred and discrimination whenever and wherever we encounter it. And the trust aims to humanize history by replacing faceless statistics and numbers with real human experience through the medium of storytelling as a tool for education. Um, and we really focus on the stories of those um, that survived the war in Bosnia and that came to the UK as refugees. Uh, in the 90s. So we work with schools, colleges, universities, various local authorities. Um, one of our big projects at the moment, and as I understand it, it's the first and the only of its kind in this country, is a project with Show Racism Red Card. It's a five-week educational program which we just finished piloting at a school here um, in Newcastle, which uses the story of Bosnia to teach 10 to 11 year olds uh, various skills in terms of critical thinking and to kind of learn lessons from what happened there. Um, so I think I've spoken longer than I thought I would. Um, so we have two excellent speakers that will go into a lot more detail and we'll, they'll be able to give a lot more um, information to this. Uh, our first speaker is Azra Berbic, a lawyer, human rights, peace building, environmental justice activist from Bosnia. Azra is a passionate human rights, peace building, and environmental justice activist, as I said, currently living in Bosnia. That's why I think it's so important to hear from her. She has been actively advocating for the rights of survivors and victims of the Bosnian genocide through her work as a lawyer and activist. And she is there in Bosnia now, as I said, visiting these different communities. And she is, I don't know how she does it, but she is literally everywhere. Um, so we are incredibly honored to have her here. So Azra, I'll hand over to you. Uh, well, thank you, Smaya. That was really nice of you. <laughs> Even though I don't consider myself an expert um, in this field, because uh, here in Bosnia and Herzegovina, especially, we consider experts as people who are scholars, but uh, because we luckily have a lot of amazing scholars in Bosnia and Herzegovina who are um, writing and researching on this issue. But um, uh, Interestingly enough, the visual for this event uh, individual was there is a photo. Um, the author was um, Ron Haviv. Um, he's a world known uh, and awarded um, conflict photographer. And he also, um, as a part of, of um, this process, um, he he uh, testified uh, in front of um, International Criminal Court for former Yugoslavia. Um, and he once told me, because I was uh, once a part of a group that he mentored, he once told us, uh, young people from Bosnia and Herzegovina, that there is no one that could be better expert than us living here uh, through this. So uh, in that context, maybe I am a, um, uh, an expert. Um, I, as Smile mentioned, I am someone who works really passionately on the issue, especially on the issue of genocide denialism and um, uh, the systematic glorification of war criminals. But also, uh, for me, it's really important to participate in a non formal education, uh, especially non formal education targeting uh, young people, not just uh, from Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also all around the region. Um, I closely work with um, um, Center for Riyut Kvart from Prijedor. Um, which is an organization that also uh, works for years, more than a, de than a decade now, uh, on the issue of, of um, they, they deal with the issue of, of lacking of education for young people on uh, war in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So they do a lot of non formal education in, in that field. And also, with, um, I worked a lot with a post conflict research center, which is based in Sarajevo. But as Smile mentioned, um, it's true, I'm everywhere because I believe I was born and raised in central Bosnia and Herzegovina. So this area was. Um, was not that much affected with the war when it comes to the extent or, of war crimes uh, and crimes against humanity as it was in uh, Herzegovina, uh, which is South Bosnia uh, uh, and, and uh, East Bosnia, uh, 
area around Srebrenica, Podrinje area. But still, um, I was born in 1991. Uh, in 1992, uh, already at the time, co uh, conflict escalated here also because I uh, live really near in the town, really near Sarajevo. Uh, so just from my perspective, I don't remember war that much from the beginning, but I do remember the end of the war and how, what were the conditions of living, especially my hometown uh, of Kakan was home of a lot of displaced people. Uh, more than 20,000 people uh, came to Kakan, um, running away from conflict from the uh, current area of Republic of Srpska entity and um, East Bosnia and also from the area around Sarajevo and from Sarajevo. Uh, so through that experience, I used to go to school, start school with a lot of uh, displaced people, refugees. Um, and um, I listened to their stories, even though back then I didn't understand it. I studied law at the University of Zenza, uh, but uh, for a context, for especially for young people who are listening to us today, I felt really jealous <laughs> when Smile told, uh, just was talking about the program that he's doing, educational program, because I know United Kingdom is one of the leading countries when it comes to uh, memorialization of, of genocide and victims and uh, spreading the truth and, and educating public through remembering Srebrenica, but also through program that Smile does. And it's um, the government and local, even local communities, um, heavily support that. Unfortunately, Bosnia and Herzegovina, you don't get that. Uh, through the system of, of a formal education, we never learn about the war. Uh, the last lesson that you learn uh, in your history class uh, is lesson that uh, how former Yugoslavia fell apart. And that's it. We, uh, when it comes solely to the genocide that happened in Srebrenica, um, I never learned a word about it uh, in my school, not in primary, secondary school, and not even at the university. We only uh, learned about um, definition of genocide and stages of genocide, which I know for a fact that now is changed, and now students are learning more about it, which I'm really happy uh, for, but it's not all around the country. So as Sma also mentioned, Bosnia-Herzegovina is uh, arguably one of the most dense, decentralized countries in the world. Uh, it's divided in two entities. There is a Bershko district uh, area, and also there is a um, which is 1% of uh, territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And there's also entity of Republic of Srpska and uh, entity of Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is again divided uh, into 10 cantons. So uh, um, it's uh, 12 cantons, sorry. So it's really um, every part of the country has its own curriculum. Uh, so that's just gives, um, an opportunity to everyone, to uh, to, to the, those local cantonal government and the entity government to create curriculums which are not um, uh, which are not accurate and which are not um, factual. Unfortunately, I did an analysis this uh, on cur different curriculums in in uh, our educational system because there are three of them. So when where there are most we Croat people, they learn from the uh, curriculum which um, young people from Croatia are learning. When it comes to Republic of Srpska entity, uh, young people there are learning a separate um, curriculum, which is mostly influenced by, by Serbian educational system. And uh, in the part of Bosnia-Herzegovina where there is most mostly populated by Bosniaks, uh, then um, uh, and I was part of that that edu uh, educational system and put I, and went through that curriculum. Um, we we learned nothing about it, so that's why I believe uh, the the non formal education and the events like this that SMI organized um, are really important um, because uh, only through these forms of non formal education we are able to educate young people and to push them to think critically and to research by themselves, uh, but it's also really difficult. Uh, I've been working all, all around the country, uh, even in, um, and I'm 
uh, really focused on small communities and on young people that are coming from small communities uh, because um, as I've previously mentioned <laughs> many times and I I just have to uh, have to uh, say it again. Young people in Bosnia Herzegovina, but not just in Bosnia Herzegovina, all around the region. Because I, I went and gave lectures and uh, participated in discussions also in Serbia and Croatia. Um, young people don't don't know um, the factuals, the facts that that um, that. Uh, were connected with the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina and in whole uh, former Yugoslavia region. Uh, why, why is that an issue? The issue is that um, after the war, um, I believe my personal opinion and opinion that a lot of people from Bosnia and Herzegovina and a lot of Bosnian scholars share with me, I would believe is that genocide didn't stop uh, when the Dayton Peace Accord were made and with, with uh, the events that happened in Srebrenica. Uh, someone might, may wonder how come, but um, we, we have been witnessing and going through systematically uh, organized um, genocide denialism campaigns, which are mostly orchestrated by uh, Serbian nationals, but also Serbian government. Uh, but also, as I've mentioned to you, to, to this uh, educational system, unfortunately, um, you can hear it, Srebrenica Memorial Center, um, in past two years, they are doing their research on the de uh, denialism of on, on cases of uh, denialism of genocide, but uh, that's only the peak, the the uh, iceberg, uh, you know, because um, it's also orchestrated to even through art, through um, educational system, through media, heavily through media, uh, and uh, I, just today I've got. Um, I've got a report from fact-checking community from Bos Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, Croatia, and Montenegro, um, and they um, they. So I would ask someone with an iPhone to mute themselves if that's okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, the thing is that they've proven that the most uh, disinformation that comes. Uh, uh, that comes um, is from Russia and from uh, Serbia, unfortunately. Um, and a lot of those disinformation and fake news that are created are created um, about the events that happened um, in, in former Yugoslavia, and especially okay, in Bosnia. Before, so, yeah. Is there an option for us to mute people who are not muted? because it's a bit distracting. So um, that, the recent events that happened uh, around 9th of January, um, um, which is unconstitutional day, which is celebrated is the day of Republic of Srpska, how they celebrate, celebrated uh, there. Um, around that day, there were a lot of, a lot of escalation of uh, heavy nationalism and Islamophobia. Um, in, in a lot of small local communities, in, uh, mostly in the Republic of Srpska. So people um, gathered together uh, and targeted um, returners, mostly Bosniaks, and were celebrating war criminals and war crimes um, uh, in public spaces, unfortunately, by singing some nationalist songs uh, and uh, even using weapons to, to scare people. Um, and that's something that people in, in it was uh, covered um, even in international media because um, somehow a lot of international journalists um, uh, find out about it through our um, diaspora community. So it was covered, but as Maya mentioned, unfortunately it was um, really shallow. Um, so that's something that um, world just now so, but that's something that people from all of those local communities in, let's say, Bratuna, Cijanja, uh, Bijeljina, Prijedor, um, Srebrenica, Vlasenica, Zvornik, uh, are facing with uh, almost on a daily basis. So um, just to give you a context, uh, 
around 11,000 people were found missing uh, in, in the area of former Yugoslavia, 7,000 uh, still missing at this point. So, um, so uh, 7,000 uh, uh, of those are people from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Just solely in uh, Srebrenica from that Podrinje area, there are still uh, 100 and, uh, 1,700 people missing. Um, and uh, people who were identified, who were vi victims of Srebrenica genocide were found in um, uh, 94, uh, mass graves around the country, unfortunately. Um, so uh, when it uh, comes just to uh, those information, uh, you can um, see uh, how, how the issue is not just, um, you know, this political situation and security crisis that we're having because of the government of Republika Srpska and political leaders. The issue is that people, regular people, are following the steps of their, and especially mostly young people, unfortunately, following the steps of their political leaders. Uh, mostly in Republika of Srpska, Serb political leader uh, Milorad Dodik, uh, who is heavily through media and even through uh, press conferences in public institution and government institution uh, institutions is um, using the language that should never be acceptable. He's gen uh, denying uh, genocide. He's glorifying war criminals. He even invited uh, some of convicted war criminals at uh, the event of celebration of 9 of January. Uh, but I believe Vanya after me will uh, talk more uh, about that political uh, issue in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So uh, what we see now is just people following their steps, steps of their, those political leaders. Um, unfortunately, we don't see enough uh, fast and efficient reaction for, from the international community. So we still have in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, we have uh, a high representative, uh, which is uh, put here from the international community. He was voted by the international community and he has a lot of uh, ways to uh, make our political leaders to act different, to punish them actually, uh, to take them their positions. But unfortunately we don't see that happening. Uh, what we uh, also don't see happening is reaction from the international community. Even though at the start of this crisis, um, we had a lot of uh, international diplomats and officials coming to Bosnia. So there were a lot of uh, members of European Parliament coming at the end of last year in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I had uh, an opportunity to meet a lot of them and also officials from the White House who also came to, uh, here to Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I also had an opportunity to meet uh, with them. I was invited by the US Embassy uh, and, but what Smile already mentioned was the fact that mostly are now our biggest um, ally at the moment and friend at the moment is, is United Kingdom uh, and the government just, uh, I believe, um, I would thank that uh, and um, uh, to, to Vanya and our uh, diaspora there uh, because they're uh, heavily advocating uh, for the issue. Um, why is that impor important? Um, I would compare this situation now with the situation uh, that's happening in Ukraine. So now we can see uh, what all these years of genocide denialism, of glorifying of war criminals and um, the, uh, the situation with the security and political crisis that we've been through actually in um, last 10 years, not just this year, but this is just a culmination of uh, everything that was happening in the past 10 years. Um, we now can see what, uh, what uh, that can produce. Because also I was following, there is a mass production of disinformation and fake news in last eight, eight years um, covering the situation in Ukraine. So it's massively produced by uh, media um, from Russia. Uh, also the uh, people uh, of Ukraine and uh, country, Ukrainian country is uh, their existence 
uh, and legitimacy is denied by the Putin, as you, you've been uh, able to hear. I, I hope people are following uh, that are following that situation. Though that's something that we have been through for uh, past 25 years. So we had a political leaders from, uh, from Serbia, but also from Croatia recently, and political leaders who are um, here in Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbian and Croatian political leaders who are uh, denying the existence of the country, the, the, the way how this country is uh, built, uh, denying, denying the existence of Bosnian language, uh, the existence of Bos Bosniaks, uh, and uh, in recent period, Milorad Dodik especially used that rhetoric. He, he, he's not uh, talking anymore about Bosniaks, but uh, about Muslims. And we also saw some international leaders, um, prominently um, Viktor Arbar, who's a uh, uh, Hungarian uh, president, who's also his, his uh, advisor uh, quoted them, uh, him that the biggest challenge for Europe is how to integrate uh, to two million of Muslims from Bosnia and Herzegovina. So uh, you can see what's the influence of all of those campaign. Um, what I would hope, and a lot of people from Bosnia and Herzegovina hope so, that uh, international community will uh, use this as an example how they should react faster before we have um, conflicts, maybe another conflict, an escalation of another conflict. Uh, because people in Bosnia and Herzegovina are scared. I'm, uh, I also advise international reporters and journalists always not just to go to Sarajevo. Because when you speak with people from Sarajevo, let's say Zantan, even Mostar, they will tell you that there is no um, issue still. They don't see the threat of a potential conflict. But when you speak with with the returners to especially with people from the area of of republic of Srpska entity and i don't know that for a fact because i'm in constant communication with people there um, and i in last two years i visited uh, more than 50 um, local communities in bosnia and herzegovina so i know for a fact that they are scared and retraumatized and can you imagine, like, there are still uh, people who haven't found the remains of their long loved ones, uh, and they are still facing on a daily basis war criminals, people for, uh, that they knew who participated in genocide, in executions, uh, people who, who were part of, of uh, organizing um, mass camps, uh, concentration camps um, in uh, that area, and, and they meet them on a daily basis. And if they're not here in Bosnia and Herzegovina living free, freely, they're, they, they're in Serbia. But we know for a fact that there are so many people who participated in these crimes and are still free and are participating in glorification of uh, Srebrenica genocide and all other war crimes and crimes against humanity that happened in, uh, that were committed um, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also they are now put in a, pro, uh, in a situation that they are re-traumatized and they are scared for their security and the, their future and future of their, their, their children. Um, so I would stop with this and uh, I'll leave Vanya to speak more broadly on um, political situation. Maybe after we can uh, back to, come back to what we expect from the international community to do, like Three steps because I took a lot of time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that account, Azra. That was really um, that was really incredible, and I'm sure there will be plenty of uh, questions at the end. And just to remind people, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat straight away. You don't have to wait till the end, um, and um, we can begin to answer those as soon as we hear from Vanya. Um, okay. We now welcome His High Excellency Mr. Vanya Filipovic, who is the Ambassador of Bosnia and Herzegovina to the United Kingdom and Ireland. And I believe for the first time here in Newcastle, virtually I know, but I do hope we will have you here in person soon. Um, as I said in my talk, I think one of the big reasons why the UK is so engaged 
with what's happening in Bosnia at the moment. I think it is due to the work and incredible work of um, Vanya. Before moving to London in September 2019, he worked as a foreign affairs advisor to Bosnia's presidency. That's the three member body that collectively serves um, as, Bosnia and, um, as Bosnia's head of state. Um, he began his career um, with a defense contractor providing linguistic support services for US peacekeepers in Bosnia and Kosovo before going on to work at the NATO HQ in Sarajevo. He then became an advisor for the member of the Bosnian um, presidency, Jelko Komšić, primarily focusing on issues concerning um, the country's NATO membership path. Um, so Vanya, over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Smayo, and thanks everybody for tuning in. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, given to me by the, the law school to, to talk to you guys and answer questions. I will try to be uh, brief. I will focus on the current um, crisis uh, that is happening in Bosnia. As uh, my previous speakers uh, pointed out, that it, it made some um, uh, media outlets and news, but not too much, especially now given the situation in, in Ukraine. And uh, we'll, we'll touch on that briefly, like uh, uh, as Azra did. But basically what, what happened uh, since 1995, when, when the fighting stopped, thanks to the signing of the peace agreement in Dayton, it was a, a peace uh, agreement brokered by US and other international diplomats, but it was primarily led by the US State Department lawyers and diplomats. And uh, it, the, pres the peace agreement preserved Bosnia as a single state, but it rearranged uh, its composition as, as you could hear uh, internally uh, breaking up the uh, um, country into uh, two entities and, uh, and the small district of Birchko, and then uh, one of the entities, the Federation further broken down to 10 cantons. And the reason for that was to basically uh, reflect the new uh, demographic reality after the war, after genocide and war crimes and ethnic cleansing and so on. Uh, the, the purpose of the war was always to break up Bosnia, but in order to do that, uh, there had to be a forceful movement of populations, uh, as, as we call, colloquially call it ethnic cleansing, and the courts later determined to be genocide and other war crimes. Uh, that was the, at, at the heart of the policies which were uh, specified even before the start of the war. Uh, on 9th of January 1992, uh, when, when Bosnia was preparing to hold the referendum on independence from Yugoslavia, which took place uh, in late February, uh, uh, Bosnian Serb nationalists basically organized a referendum establishing a virtual Republic of Serbska. And uh, that they, they still celebrate, even though it, it, is, uh, it was uh, struck down as unconstitutional by our highest court in the country in a sort of defiance of the, the law and also of the peace agreement. But interestingly, nine, uh, six days after the 9th of January, the, the, the strategic goals of the, Republic, of the then Republika Srpska leadership were, um, were uh, outlined in a document. And one of the key aspects of it was to make a demarcation between ethnic communities. Uh, Bosnia was always a extremely uh, diverse and intermixed uh, uh, society. Not only that uh, people from different communities lived side by side, they've intermarried, they had children and so on. And this went on for, for generations. So to split up Bosnia along some kind of ethnic lines uh, required a huge amount of violence. And that's that's why the war was particularly bloody and nasty. And, and uh, it, it, the, the primary victims of the war were not combatants, but, but civilians. And the worst war crime, of course, was the Srebrenica genocide, where only in the span of a few days in 1995, uh, over 8,000 uh, Bosniak or Muslim men and boys were systematically killed and, and buried throughout uh, East, East Bosnia. So the new reality after the peace agreement uh, acknowledged, unfortunately, 
unfortunately, the new demographic situation on Bosnia that these different ethnic communities were put into two uh, entities and 10 cantons. And the peace agreement uh, attempted through various means and complex uh, mechanisms to establish equilibrium between the main three ethnic groups in terms of not only uh, giving them administrative uh, or territorial units, but also to um, ensure that there will be no uh, outvoting of two against one. Uh, so uh, a lot of mechanisms were built in to ensure that uh, all the key decision making would be done through a, a consensus of all three main ethnic groups. Of course, the agreement neglected uh, the fourth uh, group, which is all other citizens. And that by that, I don't mean just the minorities, but also people who don't necessarily see themselves through the ethnic class, uh, that people who could be from Muslim or Catholic or Orthodox Christian background, but they don't see that as primary identity in their lives, uh, atheists and others and so on. So the, the peace agreement uh, preserved Bosnia, but it made it made its functioning very, very difficult and subject to a lot of veto powers, uh, which then allowed a lot of political uh, blackmailing in other words, uh, I will veto this decision until you give up on something else and so on. So a lot of key decisions were either uh, were either taken uh, over time uh, in, in packages uh, of uh, give political give and take. But uh, another important mechanism to overcome this was built in, and that was the role of international community. Basically, what happened is Dayton Peace Agreement established political and military oversight of implementation of the accords. Uh, military side was given initially to NATO-led uh, mission called S or I-4 then S-4, which was uh, then uh, taken over by the EU. Now, uh, at, uh, at, in 1995, when the first uh, uh, units came in, there were 60,000, there were only just 20,000 American soldiers on the ground. Today, uh, there's only 700 U4 troops in Bosnia, which shows that the uh, situation did uh, improve over time. Now, political side of implementation was given to the Peace Implementation Council, a group of international actors, again, uh, comprising of US, UK, Russia, uh, EU, and so on, and whose high representative uh, was given executive powers, basically, to ensure that uh, those who um, that those political actors or military actors who break the Dayton peace agreement can be removed from power as obstacles, and to impose, if necessary, uh, legislation in order to make the the uh, the make the state uh, function. So, international community was one of the key actors. Uh, in the system of checks and balances that that um, kept Bosnia running over the past 25 years. And the hope was that this complicated system, uh, ethnically based system uh, with huge amount of international interference would gradually be replaced by a more functional system that is more uh, uh, just and equal that it would give non-ethnic politics a chance that will make Bosnia into uh, what would you consider a normal functioning democracy. And for a time, for about first initial 10 years, that, that was taking, taking place. Uh, now, what happened in the first 10 years was uh, uh, that, that uh, Dayton was upgraded. So a lot of new institutions that were not specified per se in the Dayton Peace Accords were created because they were necessary for the function of the country. A single currency, for, for example, was introduced. Uh, until then, there were basically three currencies in circulation plus uh, foreign exchange, like Deutschmark was very important. Uh, uh, single uh, vehicle registration plates. Again, you had three different systems on, on the vehicles traveling through Bosnia, and that was creating a lot of uh, danger for those uh, 
traveling from one side of the country to another if you know if, if their car was uh, seen as coming from the from the other side that could put those people in jeopardy so neutral license plates were given and that enabled uh, a freedom of movement and then freedom of, of commerce to really take off uh, a number of other institutions were uh, built in over time on the state level uh, including uh, eventually the, the security agency, the state police, uh, the state uh, uh, high judicial and prosecutor, prosecutorial council, which was appointed uh, judges and prosecutors. And finally, the armed forces, which, which was the crown jewel of, of these reforms. The armed forces were especially important because it joined the former three warring sides, uh, three armies into a single one. And th this was huge, uh, uh, huge achievement, again, in which international community uh, took uh, a, a lot of uh, involvement. Now, over time, unfortunately, uh, since about 2006 onwards, the level of international interest in Bosnia waned. There was a sort of assumption that Bosnia was on the track that uh, we had some hiccups and some problems, but that our path to uh, Euro-Atlantic integration uh, was unstoppable. And the level of international involvement and in interest was, was overtaken by other events in other parts of the, parts of the world. Uh, high level you know, ministerial interests waned. Uh, things were delegated down to, to embassies in, in Bosnia and so on. And uh, and uh, nationalism that was always kind of under the surface, but managed under the watchful eye of the international community, was allowed to resurface. And it resurfaced mainly because it was politically opportunistic to to ride on these nationalist ideas that were stemming from the war from 1990s, uh, to use them to to uh, get to political power and stay in political power because that is the the most profitable position for 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 political elites uh they through through political offices they control uh the vast budgets on many levels of the government uh they have access to um a number of, of uh, positions in the in the public sector in the governments and so on and all these mechanisms were used unfortunately for, for corruption, for building patronage networks, and so on. So fast forward to the uh, last few years, um, basically uh, the, the, the level of, of uh, nationalism rose to, to such point that it became absolutely uh, normal to talk about uh, uh, for Republika Srpska to, to uh, seek own uh, independence from Bosnia, or at the very least, increase levels of autonomy, which uh, basically translates into destroying all those state institutions that were built in the last uh, 25 years and, and creating parallel ones, and making Bosnia dysfunctional, completely uh, blocking the normal work of its institutions, uh, dismantling the armed forces and 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 creating new ones again in the Republika Srpska, and uh, from the from the from the Croat side, uh, Croat nationalist side, their demands are now focused on uh, a third entity, a exclusively Bosnian Croat entity that would uh, uh, basically vote their own representatives in the in the state institutions which would be guaranteed to be from one party only. Unfortunately, both of these sides in Bosnia have their international partners and supporters in, in Serbia and Croatia and beyond. Russia is playing a much more uh, active role trying to uh, ferment these nationalist politics. They, they don't want Bosnia or entire Western Balkan region to uh, join the EU and NATO. They see this as, as a law hanging fruit for uh, sowing dissent uh, to challenging EU and NATO countries uh, in, in, in their uh, neighborhood. And basically this is where we are now that uh, 
in the last few months, uh, Republika Srpska leadership announced a plan of gradual withdrawal from state institutions and creating parallel ones, which is basically a secession in all but name, while the, the Bosnian Pride Nationalist parties are demanding uh, their own uh, third entity through the changes in electoral law. And uh, basically, uh, they are uh, threatening to make Bosnia completely uh, blocked, uh, unable to uh, run uh, any institutions unless their the demands are, are uh, met. Uh, the role of the international community, of course, it has been to prevent uh, this from happening. A lot of key stakeholders have recognized this as a path to instability and violence. Uh, people are starting to realize these are not political, uh, this is not a political situation anymore. This is uh, uh, getting into a security realm. Uh, in UK, uh, we heard demands or uh, initiatives to increase the number of international peacekeepers in Bosnia, which would be very welcome position, but we're not there yet. There's a lot of talk of imposing sanctions on the on the net, certain uh, nationalist leaders who are promoting secessionism. Uh, US has imposed some limited sanctions. A similar talk could be heard from the EU, UK, and some other states, but we will see if they act on time because uh, we are gradually slow, uh, sliding toward even more insecurity. And uh, if, if there is a uh, uh, a definite move to to build uh, a parallel institutions in Republika Srpska that will almost certainly lead to to some kind of a conflict uh, with the with the regular state uh, institutions, uh, whether it's police, military, uh, or, or whatever, and that could be a path to to much larger uh, conflict in Bosnia and, and the region. Thank you very much, Fania. Thank, and thank you to, to Azra and thank you to Smayo as well for, for three really fascinating presentations to, to set the context for, um, for our own understanding here and uh, in, in many respects to, to demonstrate how the situation, uh, well, yeah, perhaps it, 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 it is, it is slightly alarming and more alarming than we may have, um, may have anticipated in, um, uh, in, in, our own, um, uh, in our own bubbles. And that we all uh, we all exist in. Um, I, I'd like to invite people now to if you if you have any questions, please put them into the um, uh, please put them into the chat. The, the first question that we we did have was from Ellen Logan, which is what what really can British citizens do? What can people of this country do while well, they're um, in terms of raising awareness, uh, in terms of uh, engaging um, uh, in, engaging um, stakeholders uh, in, in this regard? I, I think it's a, it's a very very good question, and it perhaps goes on to the back of um, of what what, what I, I, both Azra and, and Smyo said about the the important role that the UK government has played in this. Is there, is there any obvious avenues or are there any obvious avenues or are there um, any novel avenues which um, the, the interested uh, British citizen or the interested um, person in this country can do to, um, uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, perhaps help to educate or to, to assist with the situation? I can go I'll put that, that out to everybody. Yeah. I can go. Well, firstly, uh, I, I forgot to mention, but um, now we have time for it. Um, last week, there was a hearing on the situation in Western Balkans and regarding of the role of United States in the Western Balkans in their efforts. Um, so uh, in there is a committee for Western Balkans issues uh, at the US Senate. So there was a hearing and Mr. Escobar, who was visiting uh, Western Balkans in the past few months, uh, a few times, uh, was there. Um, and he mentioned that um, week before that, he met uh, UK officials and that they are ready to impose sanctions similar to which uh, US government imposed. But I just want to give a context uh, because people might not know. Um, the sanctions imposed were um, for corruption and for the efforts of um, dissolution 
of Republic of Srpska, uh, mainly targeting um, Milorad Dodik and some uh, other uh, officials and also uh, media led by M Milorad Dodik's son which is believed that is led. It's one of the most prominent uh, media, private media in Republic of Srpska. Uh, so, um, but in my opinion and in opinion of a lot of people from Bosnia and Herzegovina people were, were disappointed because I've met Escobar and Mr. Sholey, Mr. Escobar and Mr. Sholey, and I told them that we need them to act really uh, strictly and to be more aggressive. Uh, even uh, by speaking to the public, uh, speaking with our political leaders, but also by actions, imposing sanctions. So uh, for from what we know, uh, we, it's his semi-official information, but it's important he wouldn't mention it uh, because he was uh, speaking about how they cooperate with, with UK and uh, European Union. So uh, in that context, I, um, I would al always invite people, especially young people from United Kingdom, but uh, everyone who, who believes that has any sort of influence or impact and every each and, uh, of us have of course, to, to uh, ask for their um, members of parliament who are uh, selected in their region uh, to, to speak more openly about the issue, to educate themselves, uh, to educate together, but also to educate on the background, because all of this that Smile, uh, Vanya and I talked about, it's like, it's really, there's a lot of, a lot of documents, informations. Uh, I, I shared some in, in, in chat uh, box, but um, you know, the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina was, was um, best documented war in, uh, in history of the world. So that, that, that's why uh, all those war criminals were, were sentenced, uh, even though it's not enough, but it's, it's first time in history there, there were uh, made some decision by International Criminal Court, which never have never made uh, before on cases in, from Bosnia and Herzegovina. So from that context, it's really well, re really, well documented, so people can educate themselves, but also they can educate themselves on a current situation because we have media outlets from the Western Balkans that are covering these issues uh, in English, which is Balkan Inside and uh, Kosovo uh, 2.0. So uh, people can also, uh, I would al always advise people to find people on social media who are uh, talking about it um, from, uh, from local people, you know, uh, even though I really uh, deeply admire everything that Vanya is doing and I'm especially grateful and happy that he is at the position he is because we are really happy. Unfortunately, that's some, uh, we, all of our ambassadors are not unfortunately like Vanya and uh, don't have the, the, don't advocate for the interests of all uh, people from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, so uh, Vanya also has his own personal personal story from the war. I also have my own personal story from the war. Smai also has his own personal story. You know, my mother had to um, go through uh, thousands of kilometers through the woods with me as a baby in her arms and my brother who was a child back then just to escape the conflict. Uh, but that's uh, that's something that I, that I always share. We were lucky enough to live in central Bosnia back then. Uh, if we were in 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 um, eastern Bosnia, who knows? I I probably wouldn't be that happy, and I'm, I might ha have uh, ended up as a Fatima Muhic, who is the uh, youngest victim of Srebrenica genocide. But there are, you know, a lot of people just go try to find individual stories uh, of people and people from the uh, from the local communities, as I previously mentioned, and also people who you see that are um, truly have interest of everyone that are not biased. In this context, currently, uh, mostly um, targeted community are Bosniaks, unfortunately, again. 
And there, it, this is not the uh, solely individual situation uh, specific to Bosnia Herzegovina. This is happening also in Serbia and in Montenegro, also recently, where Bosniaks were targeted uh, also uh, by all these nationalistic rhetoric, Islamophobia, and uh, glorifying on, of war criminals and uh, war crimes in front of their houses. So it's not, it, this is not just, you know, specific situation uh, for Bosnia. So I would ask people to um, make pressure, uh, public pressure, and ask their, their people who are representing them at the parliament. Um, and I would hope that UK government would make broader sanctions, impose broader sanctions on not just Milorad Dodik, he's just the face of, of this whole uh, campaign, uh, heavily national, nationalistic and Islamophobic campaign. Uh, he's dehumanizing people, literally. But there are a lot of his allies all around the country, the region also. And unfortunately, he has, uh, he found a lot of allies in, 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 in Europe, in, uh, mostly in, in France, in, in uh, Hungary. He has also, of course, he supported in Bulgaria and Russia, uh, in Belarus, and of course, in Serbia, as always. And what we recently saw also, he's heavily supported by the members of um, uh, European Parliament that are from Croatia, which is really ironic because uh, most of Croat, the Bosnian Croats from uh, that used to live uh, at the ter uh, today's territory of Republika Srpska entity uh, are not there anymore. Uh, it's just a small percent of Croats uh, that still live there. So again, two, two things, educate yourselves, spread the truth and um, push push your uh, uh, your representatives are at parliament at regional uh, governments and at, at national government to act thank you thank, thank you very much uh, as well that's very very helpful with with, um, uh, with that in mind if i could even just link, link in uh, one of the uh, a short follow up from ellen which is whether or not there is a a letter template or um, uh, an ongoing campaign in the UK, my uh, which which could be used. My understanding is that there's not. Uh, Smile, are you able to? I'm not sure whether Vanya wants to come in before me. Yeah, Vanya, please. No. No. Uh, yes, there is. There are actually several templates um, out there um, which can be used. I, I think I'll kind of just add br briefly to that. It is incredibly difficult to kind of engage, and I'm talking about someone who is obviously from Bosnia, but the UK is obviously my home as well. And yes, I do this to raise awareness of what is still happening in Bosnia, but also I do it because, again, what happened in Bosnia can happen here. And for me, the first step to kind of safeguarding the, you know, the society that we have here, which is an incredible society, um, is actually the acceptance that what happened in Bosnia can happen here and can happen anywhere. So as Vanya said in his, his talk, you know, most families were, you know, intermingled, you had uh, intermarriages and resulted in, in such a bloody, such a bloody war. So what I do personally and what I've been doing for the last seven years and what the trust does is use my personal story and a traumatic and painful story and I'm not saying everyone can do that because I know there are so many people within the Bosnian community that haven't got the energy to that and I completely understand because I know how draining it is um, is for me but what I've done is I've worked with the local council here in Newcastle working with several um, councillors um, we actually wrote together with councillors Rebecca Shatwell uh, a motion recognising the genocide in Bosnia. Again, not just in Srebrenica, but recognising atrocities that were committed at, uh, across Bosnia, committing to um, remembering and commemorating the genocide in Bosnia every single July. So the UK is pretty much, I think, the only country other than Bosnia that has an official uh, 
uh, Bosnian Genocide Memorial Day, which again, I think is incredible. Uh, incredible. So the council then made that commitment that, that was unanimously passed in 2018. As part of that motion, I took a group of councillors as well as religious leaders to Bosnia in October of 2018. And since then, that work has just snowballed. So having that intimate um, understanding and building that intimate relationship with your local representatives is key. There are several initiatives in this country and across the world, protests and so on, and it's an incredible initiative. I personally think that has limited success because what is the point of a uh, pro protest? You might have 100, 200 people there. Again, I'm not shooting that down. That's incredible that people are doing that. But for me, one of the best ways to do that is to engage more politically. So I regularly meet um, members of my council here, my local MP, and I've been doing that in London as well. So I'm in London every couple of um, months, really, where I'm meeting various representatives through the work that I do. So in January, I was able to speak um, in several events that included uh, Kia Starmer, um, William Gov, various ministers and MPs. And basically that's the kind of way that we need to engage with this. But as I said, the best way to do that is if we start building up that personal relationship. And then for the people that may not be from Bosnia to support, support us alongside that. So writing letters, organizing events and inviting these representatives. So education is key, but education is so such a big thing. So how do we uh, um, do that? The trust, again, we work with schools, colleges, universities, unions, police, ambulance services, that's one side. And then educating and working with local councils is another side. I also work with um, Remembering Srebrenica as well. Um, and right now I'm trying to kind of repeat and emulate what we've done in Newcastle. We've got a similar setup in Sunderland, Gates, Durham, South Tyneside, pretty much all the local authorities across the Northeast. And for me, that's the best way to engage on that personal uh, personal level. And then to have friends, because it wouldn't be possible this work without supporters like yourselves uh, to make this happen. Um, so that that's kind of, that's my strategy. I'm not saying it's the best strategy, but that's, I don't know if Vanya wants to add anything to that. Before uh, before Vanya comes in, could 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 I even suggest Vanya as the as the representative of the, the the Bosnian people in the United Kingdom and Ireland, could could you add on to it what you think the Bosnian diaspora in particular could do as well as uh, UK citizens as as that would uh, that would take care of one of our other questions as well. Uh, no, I think both uh, Smile and Azar were right on point on, on the ways that they can engage, but also. Uh, uh, um, getting more media attention would be very helpful. Media has a key role, uh, especially today. Uh, and I'm not talking about just social media, which everybody's using, but it which which has become a little bit chaotic with, with uh, you know, with, with the bombardment of news and fake news from every corner in the world. But people with stories like Smayo and everybody else, you know, especially people who came to this country in 1990s, about 10,000 Bosnians, we estimate. They have incredible stories, not story, not only stories of what they went through, but incredible stories of uh, how they found shelter in this, in this country and how they rebuilt their lives and how they're contributing back to their communities. And we are extremely, extremely proud of how well they, they have done, but also thanks to, to the host nation uh, and thanks to local communities that, that took them in. Great, Th thank you very much. With, with that, as he's, um, I'll, I'll flag just that Smile has put his um, uh, the the website of the trust and the uh, his email address and, and the email address of the trust into the into the chat there. We have a question from Neil who is asking, "What more do you think should be done to bring war criminals within Bosnia Herzegovina to justice?" Um, I, I'll put that out to the to our, to our guests uh, if anybody wants to take take that question. It's more so a regional issue, unfortunately, now, because especially, um, you know, there are people in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bosnian Croats and Bosnian Serbs uh, have opportunity to have uh, either Serbian or Croatian citizenship. So that makes them uh, not available to, to Bosnian justice system sometimes, because if there, there were even uh, cases when uh, they were somehow um, people who 
uh, were to be, be accused for war crimes or crime, crimes against humanity, uh, they've been informed somehow that there is an investigation on their behalf, you know, so uh, they they fled the country. So they they became unavailable to the to the justice system of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And there are a lot of political leaders from Bosnia and Herzegovina that are for years now advocating and trying to make our government and re, uh, government from two other countries to make an agreement in which they are, if there is a, like someone who, who uh, escaped to Bosnia, uh, that uh, our officials would give them to Serbia and uh, uh, also if Serbia would uh, give uh, people to Bosnia and Herzegovina officials, but unfortunately we, we haven't seen that happening and I'm not that um, uh, I don't believe that's going to happen soon, especially taking in consideration current situation and, and uh, uh, the, the escalation of, of security, uh, issue of the security uh, situation in Bosnia Herzegovina and in the region also. Um, from the other hand, we, we also have, we had um, a reform uh, in 2000s, at the beginning of the 2000s of our juridical system. But also, uh, it's uh, deeply influenced, influenced by the uh, political leaders, unfortunately. Um, how? Because uh, legal uh, bodies uh, of Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Republic of Srpska and national legal bodies some, sometimes had to confirm um, uh, someone who's prepositioned to have a position as a, a prosecutor, public prosecutor or a judge or member of uh, National Criminal Council or whatever. So uh, that's how people are, uh, uh, those institutions who should be completely independent are influenced by uh, political leaders. And we see that. We see uh, that because we had, um, situation, uh, I shared some links from uh, Birn Pich. They follow that, they, they follow all the trials, as fo especially focus on war crimes and crimes against humanity um, uh, or at our national court. Uh, but um, unfortunately, there are cases where public uh, prosecutors haven't uh, charged uh, anyone in period of last five years, you know. Uh, so, um, I would be happy if um, even that if that has to be imposed by the international community, I wouldn't care, but I would be happy to see those people who are not doing their job and they are paid really, very well, extremely well, especially for our uh, standard. Uh, if they are not doing their job, uh, let's say at least within a year period, they should be uh, replaced by people who are willing to do their job. So. Um, also, there's a big issue of, of um, you know, so much time has passed. Uh, uh, so uh, it's uh, becoming more and more difficult to, to have witnesses, to have um, evidences even, but also witnesses because just naturally people are dying. Uh, and uh, so that's also one of the, of the main issues in the country. Uh, I would be happy to see uh, uh, our uh, national court uh, do more of their, uh, 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 do more. And uh, I would like to see more people bring there, but uh, there are those two issues, you know, they're heavily influenced by political leaders. And also there is an issue that people are just leaving the country uh, in order not to be, because we still now have people who are sentenced, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina national court sentenced them to, to certain amount of years for war crimes committed in past war, but they are living Syria in Serbia, you know, and that, that's really ridiculous. That, that's really, that's just shows you how that system and that country is participating, willingly participating in, in, in uh, that because they, they just don't. And those are people who are not born in Serbia you know, they are born in Bosnia and Herzegovina, born and raised. They, they, in most cases, they committed their crimes. Uh, they killed their, their, um, their neighbors, unfortunately. So, um, 
that's the issue. I would I would like to see also the international community um, try to to make uh, uh, some sort of regional agreement, just at least to to you know to uh, be a partner who would make bring us all to the table to the same table so we can make a mutual agreement on that so we we can have the uh, same practices that would be really helpful. Thank you very much, Ashwa. Again, a very, very detailed answer, and I see a lot of um, symmetry, perhaps between um, uh, uh, between between your answer and, and some other post-conflict um, um, communities. We, we have we have um, perhaps time for maybe one or or two questions left. Um, I'll I'll put them in together. We have one from Tina, which says, as someone who grew up in Croatia, knowing very little about it. Uh, I would like to know what can be done to raise more awareness for Croats and others in Croatia. And uh, uh, another one, um, uh, my question is linked to Tina's, what scope is there for something like the BGET, uh, the trust, to be established in Bosnia and other relevant countries to change hearts and minds at the grassroots level? Um, I'm conscious, I think we're about to lose Vanya. Um, uh, and with that, I would just like to, to express our, our, my heartfelt thanks to um to him for 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 attending this evening i know he's got another engagement um so so thank you very much for um for, for attending and, and giving us your comments um uh, it, they've been uh, yeah it, it really has been quite a special honor to have you along this evening um uh for it um uh, with that i think i can pass over to, to smile and azra in case they have any uh, any comments Azra, do you do you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I told like I would leave at least one question to you, but it's okay. Uh, that's another issue that I uh, just recently started to to work on. You know, even when we come back to, if we go back to Second World War, young people in the region uh, don't know that much about the events that happened in Second World War. Uh, so um, I would just mention, and I also I will also share that link. So Post Conflict Research Center recently created a curriculum that could be used in in uh, schools around the region, in order to educate young people about Holocausts. So that's also an issue. Just to start with that, and I know for sure when you ask young people about um, Yasenots. Uh, Tina would know what I'm talking about, and uh, we, which was a huge concentration camp where where a lot of uh, Jew, Jews, uh, Roma people, and Serbs uh, were put in um, by uh, NDH. Um, and uh, you you get you'll get the same answer as if you ask young people about Srebrenica in Serbia. Unfortunately, I know there are a lot of young people who are activists or even not activists, but are uh, interested in, in educating themselves by themselves because knowledge is now more than ever available, you know? So uh, at least if you know, don't know where to go, you can always go to the, uh, to the uh, archi archives of international courts, uh, international criminal court, because everything is completely available. If something is not available, you, you can find it. There are, there are also transcripts, uh, so-called transcripts of, of genocide, uh, which Serebrenica Memorial Center also recently, uh, recently uh, shared. But I would also, again, encourage young people to, to just to try to find it, uh, stories of the individuals because often we get um you know we don't see people behind the numbers so that's why i believe this uh, something that uh, smile is doing with his organization is huge and is extremely important and i also share this link of uh testimonies that were recorded uh, and done by Srebrenica memorial center and Birbich. that's why i shared it and i also shared the stories on ordinary heroes so people from di different ethnic backgrounds who saved each other saved their friends or people who uh, have never met before uh, previously so 
um, that's how I would make people to 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 educate, ask people to educate themselves because it it is reachable, knowledge is available. But I know for a fact that I also knew so little about the events that happened in Croatia, unfortunately. Um, I also uh, find myself knowing so little about the events that happened, the war in in, in Croatia also, but uh, in Kosovo. And that's lacking of um, regional cooperations also between uh, NGOs, civil society sector in that manner, when uh, you have unfortunately only pretty similar group of people who are you know, going to the same events and who also have agreed on their opinion and they acknowledge the truth, but that's not the point for me. Uh, the point is to educate young people. I would invite Tina uh, and all of her friends, she can like catch me up later, but there is a Srebrenica summer school organized by uh, Post Conflict Research Center and um, and Srebrenica Memorial Center. In past two years, we organized it. We invited young people from whole region. Uh, in, in Croatia, there is a uh, huge initiative for human rights. They're doing an amazing job. They also participated in the event last year. So we uh, organized that event in past two years. We uh, bring um, people from the civil society sector, survivors. We also bring people from Severance Memorial Center, but not just from, because as Smile previously mentioned, and it's needed to mention, uh, Bosnian war, and it's not just what happened in Srebrenica. It's unfortunately much more. Srebrenica was just culmination of everything that was orchestrated and prepared and that was happening years before. So uh, I would invite young people to apply for or just to, uh, uh, to, to, to try to find credible sources and to apply to, for Srebrenica Summer School because we also bring scholars from all, all around the world, not just, uh, not just from the region, to educate young people. And uh, last year we had a lot of people from, uh, from UK also, uh, from uh, France, from uh, US. Italy and from whole region. So um, I know it's difficult. It's difficult because uh, these stories are difficult. If you would only uh, hear a uh, smile story, it's really difficult. But we have to put ourselves in those situations because that's how we can emphasize. You, uh, uh, that's how we can, you know, again, repeat those stories to, to our friends and families and colleagues. If you listen to the individual stories, uh, I believe that's the best way you will get the sense of what was happening, and then you can share it with other people. I know that's not, this is not a concrete answer because we don't have systematic way of doing it, unfortunately. Uh, but at least to find a credible sources, that's the best, best, best option, especially in Croatia. It's, it's, there are a lot of, um, I used to go to, to Vukovar to give some lectures uh, years ago and to participate in some conferences. And it was really uh, amazing feedback that I got from, but I know still it's a small, small group of people. But what's, what's also interesting you know, there was a recently, I know it's not um, close to this context, but I believe it is. Um, there was a recently an event in, in that my friend uh, told me about in, in Berlin that happened, a girl from Turkish uh, background was attacked by a group of people and they would, uh, they used uh, racist slurs and Islamophobic slurs. So, um, and around five to six people beat her in the tram and nobody reacted. So <laughs> I believe when, if we dare to speak about something, to learn about something, and if we are the ones uh, to, to, to make that first step, to educate ourselves and then to try to educate the others, that's the way to go because I also am really much aware that Bosniaks are not only victims of last war and are not only victims of this current system where the nationalistic leaders, uh, 
nationalist leaders are trying to keep their position, positions uh, by sharing nationalistic and hatred rhetorics. So um, I would encourage everyone to, to try to do it, to make a first step you know, in, in educating themselves and, and sharing the truth. Um, Thank you very much, Azra. Thanks, Azra. What, what, what we can tell, I think, coming through from you is is where the lawyer and activist collide, um, and uh, uh, you, you've certainly given us uh, considerable food for thought tonight. Well, I, I, unfortunately, I have to draw things to a close because I, I I know that we um, uh, that the people will, will be will will be disappearing off. Um, uh, one of the things that Azra said, uh, which really struck, struck struck a chord, which we don't see people behind the numbers, uh, and I, I think that that's very true. Um, uh, we have um, uh, one of the final questions to come in um, from from Ellen again it was about whether or not um, there was there could be more effort to put on uh, to put um, uh, what what has happened in the genocide on the British curriculum and I think that the, the, there's there's great merit in that and I think that the importance in seeing the people and not the numbers is is critical to that. With that in mind, I, I really do want to emphasize that the great work that Smile is doing with his trust. Um, and uh, I know it's a growing project and, uh, and it's a passion of his. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to hand over to Brahman uh, for just our, our, our final comments. But, but I want to, to conclude by, by giving my, my own personal and real, real sincere thanks to, to Smayo and Brahman, who, who really did most of bringing together tonight's, um, tonight's event. I'll, I'll pass over to Brahman for her, her, her final words. But, but, but please, um, uh, it, it certainly was, was, was uh, Smayo and Brahman's um, uh, work, which got us to, to to having such a such a, a rich discussion tonight with our guests. Well, thanks, Connell. Um, and actually, all I want to do really is to thank the speakers because really you've done something quite remarkable. I think you've educated us all in something that was um, probably quite far from a lot of people's minds and brought it to the forefront. So I think that's incredibly important. I think we're especially grateful to His Excellency Ambassador Filipovic um, and to Astra Berbic. I've tried to copy Smile's pronunciation there, so I don't know how well I did. But you know, you've both really given so generously of your time and um, and your efforts and so on. And really, I think it's um, noteworthy that you've given us some concrete steps. I think we've noted that we can contact our MPs, our representatives, and so on, and engage in that way. So I think that's excellent. Um, also, thank you so much, Smayo. I mean, you're at the centre of this, of this event. It's your constant advocacy work that has made the event possible. Um, and so, you know, I'll just echo what uh, Connell has said about your educational trust, the Bosnian Educational Trust, which I think is remarkable. Um, also, I want to credit Sharon Pointer for introducing um, you to me, Shmaya, because without her spotting that there might be a useful collaboration between um, the Newcastle Forum for Human Rights and Social Justice, um, you know, in, in that way, um, we wouldn't have perhaps uh, been able to do this, so that is good. Also, just general um, Thanks, enormous thanks actually to Helen Hansen who did the administration. So she's actually done a great, she's done a great job. Huge thanks to Connell Mallory. Massive thanks to the audience um, because we've had, um, you know, problems in sharing things because the strike, which we all obviously agree with the aims of the strike, um, but, you know, it made it quite difficult to um, circulate information about it. Nevertheless, we've had a really high registration and a really good um, attendance. So thank you to everybody who's attended, especially those who've made it right to the very end, because you're still here and I can still see that there are um, a good number of people still here. So um, you're all welcome, if you're local in particular, to join the Newcastle Forum for Human Rights and to follow up with um, other activities and events and hopefully we will have a follow-on event from this so that um, we don't just sort of you know make this a one-off because I think the educational aspect of this and raising awareness is key. Um, so uh, the recording of the meeting will be available um, on our website, it'll be available on the on, on Shmaya's uh, Bosnia Educational Trust website as well. So if you didn't manage to get in at the beginning the whole um, um, recording will be available. And, um, and I'm sure that if you've got questions, you can contact, um, um, you know, the, the, the forum in the, in the future. But um, thank you for all of your questions. It's been very, very useful, very insightful, as um, Mokhada said, just said. And um, yeah, so have a, enjoy the rest of your, the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you.